I'm Scott Owl Miller, and this is my life living in Latin America. Because it has been raining nonstop for days, and we are going into the heaviest rain of the year, we had a tor torrent last night. Uh, I am recording in the office today. It's the only chance that I have. So today, I've had a lot of questions over a long period of time. I get asked by a variety of people about this, and I come from all different places, but the question keeps coming up, and it needs to be addressed, is, isn't my show, and I totally appreciate the incredible vote of confidence that you guys have in just how impactful my show must be, because there is no way I'm this impactful. But I really appreciate the vote of confidence that my show and others are going to do so much good or promote Nicaragua so heavily, uh, or Latin America in general, but Nicaragua is really what people are concerned about, uh, that it is going to cause problems that it is going to become like a Costa Rica and just become a place that people don't want to go to or live in. And there's a lot of different aspects to this, whether it is the Nicaraguense are no longer able to afford living in their own country, that's a risk, that tourists are no longer going to want to come visit, that's a risk, that expats are not going to want to move here anymore, of course, a big risk. So those are the things that people seem to be concerned about. And they mention this and they ask, isn't this something that I should stop doing because we don't want to create this problem? And of course, we don't want to create this problem. So is it a realistic fear? And if so, what can we do about it? Or why do we continue to do the show? We're going to get to that right after the bump. The show just feels a lot more complete with the neon on. I don't know why I didn't have it on before. It looks way better now that it's there. Okay, so yeah. So this is a real concern. Of course, we've seen it happen other places, not from a single show or anything like that. I truly do appreciate that people think my show is gonna drive that many people to Nicaragua. I hope those are the kinds of problems we have to tackle and not other ones that's that we can deal with. We can figure that out. We're just not that big of a show, but thank you. So. There's a lot of things that go on here. So the first thing I want to talk about is levels of desirability in tourism and expatting. We're going to kind of lump these together. I understand that they are very different things, and at some point we have to separate them, but for in general, when we're simply saying Nicaragua is safe, it's affordable, it's beautiful, it's got these great things to come do, you know, come see live music, come, right? It applies pretty much equally. Just come down and visit for a week and make it your family vacation, or consider retiring here and come down early. Like, all these different things come together. So we can kind of lump these groups together for the purpose of this discussion. When you're a country, right, any country, you have a certain level of tourism that is ideal. Now, I understand not everyone knows what that number is, and I don't mean that like, well, John doesn't know, but Larry does. No, what I mean is, is that there's different opinions as to exactly what an ideal level is. Uh, some countries want a lot of tourism because it's a core part of their economy. Some countries want very little tourism because it's not part of their economy and they see it as a detriment to their way of life or complicated for whatever reason. Some places change over time. Uh, most places change over time. And we just made a video recently where we were talking about Europe and especially Spain where they are making a really heavy turn against tourism because they see their own countries as being over touristed. And so they're making adjustments to try to deal with that, whether at a local level or at a national level. That the national level has started to take an interest in it really shows that they're gauging this as a, as a complete problem across their uh, entire country and not just a localized problem because of a popular beach. Here in Nicaragua, it is safe to say from basically every aspect that you're looking at, whether it is the people who operate within the tourism industry, the Department of Tourism, or the government in general, that they currently see the ideal level of tourism in Nicaragua as being higher than the current level of tourism, tourism being combined with expatting, uh, today. So what basically everyone wants is more tourists. Now, there are always isolated parts of the, the economy who are negative against foreigners or tourism, possibly, regardless of whether or not they're, they're foreigners. That's always going to exist. The idea that someone's like, we don't want you here, go home. There's always that person anywhere, even if you really need the tourism. And it could be someone who just doesn't like foreigners. It could be someone who just doesn't like their neighbors who operate a restaurant to get any more customers because they don't like those people and they don't work in that sector, they don't benefit from it directly or they don't see the benefits from it, whatever. There's a lot of reasons why someone may be like that. They're always going to be there in every location across the world. They're rarely a major part of the population, so don't be dissuaded because somebody makes that claim. 
and they're, they're always going to attempt to claim that they're acting on behalf of society. You know, our country doesn't need you here. Well, that's not for you to say, right? People in general, like, vote on their government or somehow approve their government, depending on, like, if you have a king, like England, like, there's a pro, like, they just kind of accept that that person represents them, whatever, and that person's job or that, you know, department or whatever, they decide how much tourism is best for society, and they have bigger things to look at than one person's person personal opinion, they have to consider things like what creates the knock-on effect of creating more jobs, right? Oh, we don't really like having foreigners on our beach, we want it just for us. Granted, pretty much everyone feels that way, if nothing else mattered. Not 100%. Some people are like, what? Foreigners are interesting to talk to. I want, you know, them there too. That happens, right? You get all kinds. But in general, most people don't want tourists around if they're not providing some other value because they kind of just get in the way and they make things cost more, right? Pretty much universally. So, understood. But they generally create jobs, whether at the airport, in customs, by staying in hotels, by eating in restaurants, by consuming food in the country, by shopping in souvenir shops, and so forth, all of those things add up and create jobs. And those jobs that they create generally spend money in the economy as well, instead of being break-even, so they create jobs, each layer creating a lot fewer jobs than the layer before it, but it all adds up. So a, you know, a small group of tourists could create rather a large number of jobs throughout the entire economy. And the government needs to look at these things. How does it impact the entire country? Not just one person not wanting to see a tourist on the beach. They have to balance that as well, but it's a, it's a big picture. So governments take this into account. So even though someone may be like, I don't want tourists, and you can imagine Mexico, right? You go to Cancun, nobody in Cancun really wants tourists. But if you look, talk to the Mexican government, they're like, we built Cancun just for tourists. Like, we put so much money into having nothing but tourists there. And so why would we ever want fewer tourists? We want as many tourists as we can pack into Cancun. That's why we put them in this remote location, so they're not impacting other things. Nicaragua does the same thing. We want as many tourists as we can put in San Juan del Sur. But in the rest of the country, we have limits. Not hard limits, just limits to how much we want. But in San Juan del Sur, whether there's 5,000 or a hundred thousand, the rest of the country doesn't really care. That's just generating uh, income from there and it spreads out to the rest of the country. But as long as they're isolated there, it doesn't really matter how many there are. And so there's, there's techniques to isolating tourism and expatting to specific places and enclaves play a role in that so that countries can maintain, in theory, good, healthy relationships with society and tradition and cultural values, while also having tourism engines that increase the overall flow of the economy. And then, of course, places like Nicaragua, most places, right, Mexico too, they may have these pockets, Cabo as well, where they have tons of tourists, but then they have other places where they have some tourists, and they want to keep that level really low, they're not going to put a hard limit in most cases, but they're going to encourage, maybe not have a tourist bus that goes there, maybe not encourage as many hotels, maybe raise the tax rate on hotels a little bit in those places and make it that the number of tourists you're going to get are relatively low, only, you know, 0.1% of the population instead of 50% of the population. And then people are like, oh yes, we've seen a tourist, but they're rare, right? They're not changing how restaurants behave. They're not changing how street food works. They're not changing um, housing costs or anything like that. So countries have a lot of tools, and ones that we are not mentioning as well, in order to modify how tourists and expats behave within their country. So places like Nicaragua are still in a position where they, they, they may not be completely open on the floodgates. They may not be like, absolutely everyone, no matter what, just come here. Anything it takes, come here. We want to have as many people as possible. They may not be in that boat today, but they are in a, we really want tourists, how do we encourage them? kind of way. So a, a most of the way there, maybe a 90% uh, open floodgate kind of scenario. Nicaragua definitely wants a lot more tourists than it currently has uh, and more expats because it has empty hotels still, opportunity to build more, it has houses for sale, they can't sell as many as they need to, uh, all those things. They need expats and tourists to help fill those places. And then once those are full, then they can evaluate. Do we build more? Do we encourage building more? Do we lower taxes? Do we raise taxes? What do we do? Right. But right now, they're at a really noticeable tourism deficit over what they would want to have. And so we need to do encouragement to get it up to that level. You certainly don't put on the brakes 
when you're not yet at the healthy level. If anything, you want to go, you bounce just above the healthy level, have the brakes on, bring it back, maybe dip just a little bit, and then and course correct to try to hold a healthy level as best you can. What you don't want to do is be severely short and say, well, it's possible to overshoot, so instead of possibly overshooting a little, we're going to fall short a lot that doesn't help, right? That's like saying in bowling, I'm really worried about going too far left and maybe missing the pins, so instead I'm just gonna put it in the gutter on the right and never try. That's basically what it is. You don't wanna do that, right? Now, the theory that I think a lot of people have is that uh, tourism is a runaway train and once you encourage people to move to a place, it's just going, the train's on the tracks and there's nothing you can do about it. And that is anything but the case. But people point to, of course, Costa Rica, which is very nearby, and to some degree Mexico, which is not too far away, and they're generally thinking of Cancun in that area, the Costa Maya, and saying these are places that are just so touristy that it has ruined all the things that we perceive as having been their values there. They are no longer like Nicaragua. Now they're places that we don't want to go. The reasons that we want to come to Nicaragua don't exist in these places anymore. I don't want to go there, at least not to live, especially for expats, right? We may be like, oh, weekend in Costa Rica, cool. Do I want to move there as an expat? No, I want to be in Nicaragua. Why? Totally different vibe and a big piece of it is because of the number of tourists, the size of the tourism industry in Costa Rica. But we have to consider, Costa Rica could apply the brakes. They have lots of mechanisms to curtail tourism. They could raise the cost at the airport, basically airport taxes. They can make visas harder to get. They can limit the number of people that comes in. They have comp control of the tourism industry. They, it's not something out of their control. It's not actually a runaway train. It is really heavily in the hands of the government and Costa Rica from what we can tell, is continuing to keep the attract tourist uh, pedal down. Maybe not all the way to the floor, but they're definitely pushing the pedal and saying we want more tourists than we have currently. Now, a lot of Costa Ricans, a lot of Ticas, may not agree with that. But just because a lot of people doesn't agree with it doesn't mean that that is not the official stance. So the country officially is trying to get more people. Well, they may not publish that somewhere, but we can tell from their actions that they are continuing to make their visas easier for people to get. They're continuing to make things cheaper and more accessible so people can keep coming to the country without any additional or unnecessary barriers. They're doing all of that because they still want not just the number of tourists that they have, but more. Maybe not a lot more, maybe 1% more. And if you're Costa Rica, you already are getting a lot, so just doing a lot to encourage more may not give you that much more because you're already getting so many that the people who are interested, they're already there. So maybe they're working really hard to get that last little long tail of additional interest. That makes sense. But Costa Rica, while we as Nicaraguans or people who are living in Nicaragua and people who are looking at and interested in Nicaragua tend to look at Costa Rica and say, well, that's not what I want. It's different than saying, well, that's not good for them because they clearly, as a country, believe that it is and that more would still be better. We don't know how much more. Maybe they only want a tiny bit more. Maybe if they got 2% more, they'd be like, whoa, this went too far. We need to bring it back some. We could be that close. We don't think that they're too far away from what their good, healthy number is, but they're clearly acting as if they don't feel they're at that good, healthy number yet. They're at a, a generally good number, but they feel they could be better and they're working on that. So it's easy for us to look from remote and say, well, there's all these negatives to that. Sure, but they're evaluating what the alternatives are as well, and they clearly believe that the alternatives are not as good as where they are now and will not be as good as if they do some growth. So they're evaluating. Now, maybe they're evaluating wrong. They could be making mistakes, just as we could, but if you consider who is more likely to make a mistake, the overall population and government of Costa Rica, who has firsthand knowledge of all kinds of things and has been testing things over a long period of time and is intimately uh, working with it every day, or the rest of us who are just casually looking at it from a distance and saying, well, it's no longer the place that I would pick to live, so therefore I think the entire economy is bad, that we're very likely to be wrong. There's essentially no chance that Costa Rica is getting this wrong. There are, of course, negatives that come with that, and I don't think a lot of Nicaraguans want to turn into the next Costa Rica, but just because we're trying to improve from where we are doesn't mean we're going to make the same decisions that they are. It's unrelated things, right? What Costa Rica has done does not impact what Nicaragua will do. So let's imagine that my show does take off. You guys go out there and you share this with all kinds of people. You hit like and subscribe all the time. More people join the membership, and we just, we just take off as a channel. People start commenting more, and you start sending in lots of video questions 
impressions. And we just, we moved from 10,000 to 100,000 subscribers and just everybody's looking at Nicaragua. Are we going to accidentally put a train on the tracks that cannot be stopped and end up with over tourism and over expatting that is beyond what the country can bear? So quite simply, the answer is no. There's no possibility for my channel to do this, to have this effect, regardless of how popular the channel becomes. Even if I become like Rick Steves, I become one of the top travel influencers in the world, which is never going to happen as a first thing, but imagine that it did, I would still not be able to have this kind of effect. Why? Because one, social media does not drive that much traffic in reality, but even imagine that it did. Not just that my channel doesn't, but no channel does. But let's imagine that they did. There still isn't a fear because in order for those things to work, the conditions under which we are promoting must remain. And those things will change. Now, of course, we could lie and present a different view of the country. That'd be difficult to do. One of the things that attracts people to my channel, I assume people seem to really like it. It's what really kind of builds a channel is that I walk around and show the country as it really is. I can't really hide things without just not going to places. Like if I don't want to show you San Juan del Sur, I have to not go there. Now I haven't been there very, very often, but plan to go and get some more view. But when we're there, we show the streets, we show what it's like. And so it's very difficult to uh, fake that. In the future, AI will allow a lot more faking of that, but you get the point. The thing that makes my channel my channel is that I'm actually showing you the country and people love the fact that this is a unique view of a place they often don't get to see. That makes it very different than what a lot of other people produce not just here, but in a lot of places. But if we started seeing a change, for example, if the prices start going up, if there's more uh, extra heroes or foreigners, as we call them, uh, on the streets, if there's starting to be new construction that's making things look and behave differently, all those things will be super evident on the show. And we'll notice that being able to go out to have the, the culture change, like everything will be really evident. If we go show Costa Rica in exactly the same way, you will instantly say, well, that's not Nicaragua, that's Costa Rica. You can tell because everything's different. Who's on the streets, what restaurants look like, how people interact, what normal social circles are like. All those things are very different in Costa Rica. Not bad, not worse, just different. Right? You would see those things and they would change in Nicaragua if that was actually going to happen. So we don't anticipate that. But let's say it started to happen. Two important effects. Two important effects would, would start to take place. The first is that you, the viewers, would start to react differently based on what you're seeing as changes. So instead of being the group who's like, ooh, I want to go there because there's no tourists, it'll start being the group that's like, ooh, I want to go where there's some tourists, but not a lot of tourists, right? It'll start to shift. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the government constantly monitors the situation, not through my channel, well, maybe, but not through my channel, but through checking border control and uh, residencia paperwork and those kinds of things. They know how many people have come into the country, how many have gone out of the country, and how many people have made attempts at long-term staying in the country. And then they hypothesize what the other people are doing, but they have a pretty good handle on that because they have really good metrics on that day to day and over time. So they're able to see trends, anticipate things and so forth. They're also able to see directly the results of what they do, right? If they make a new rule and it goes into effect on September 15th, and then on September 16th, something changes, they can see those correlations relatively easily. So that all that says that the government is constantly evaluating whether they want to encourage people a lot, encourage people a little, be neutral, discourage people a little, discourage people a lot, or simply not allow them. All those things are at their disposal and they can do a lot of different things at different stages. And we don't know what they may want to do or try to do or decide to do, but they have a lot of tools. Some of those tools include simply not issuing as many visas. They can close the borders. First of all, if they don't want people to come in, they can not let them come in. It's that simple. They can make higher requirements. Right now, it costs about $10 to enter the country. Well, what if they made it 12 or 15 or 20? At some point, it starts to impact the number of people that comes in while actually bringing in more revenue. So that's a great way to go because people who want to come in are going to be like, well, I was willing to spend 10, I'll spend 20. But people who are like 20, that seems like a lot. They're probably a very small number of the population. And unless they're half, it's going to make more money through border control. So that is something they may do. They may make the requirements for coming in a little bit more stringent. Right now, there's for most people coming in, Europe, North America, Mexico, most of Latin America, a lot of other places, Algeria, 
Nigeria, there's no requirement at all. Just show up, have a passport, welcome to Nicaragua. But they can change that very easily. They can start doing visa on arrival. They can start doing pre-arranged visas. And they can start putting heavy limits on them. If you look at what it's like for Nicaraguans to go to the United States, they have all these things in place today. This isn't some hypothetical pie-in-the-sky kind of thing. This is what countries do every day all over the world. Costa Rica wants to limit the number of Nicaraguans going in so they make it, to the best of my knowledge, $30 for them to go in. It's something you can do, but it's something that keeps you from just walking across the border every 15 minutes because it's so convenient, right? So they gauge, like they don't want to stop people coming in, but they don't want to make people just wander over the border, so they come up with a happy medium. Nicaragua will likely do this, should the, the need arise, with people from all over the world. They'll pick the places that they want to uh, encourage or discourage and change slightly what their visa is like, what their costs are like, the length of stay that they're allowed to have, how easy it is to get residency, uh, how much they allow border runs. Right now, border runs are very easy. That doesn't have to stay that way. They can easily uh, say, you, you don't get to do border runs, or you get to do one, but only one, or whatever, right? All these things are at their discretion. They can change them at a moment's notice, and they can always, if they need to, kick people out. That's super not expected. I don't know very many countries that would ever consider doing that, but those are tools at their disposal. They're not caught in a situation where we simply say, oh, it's a beautiful country, lots of people come, and Nicaragua's stuck with them. It doesn't work that way. So, as a country, they will do a lot of things. Now, of course, long before they do anything like that, they're likely to stop with advertising, right? Instead of being like, we got to push all these cultural events and reasons to come and promoting things, they'll stop promoting things externally and just be like, hey, if you find us, you find us. If you don't, you don't. But channels like mine will undermine this particular goal. So that is a spot where they need to step it up and say, okay, now we're going to start raising the cost of coming in or possibly issuing visas or putting in quotas and that kind of thing. So they have a lot of things that they can do. And of course, they can do other things that are similar, such as raising the tax rate on hotels. They can put more limits on Airbnbs. They can, uh, any number of things like that. Um, and we see different countries all throughout the world doing different things. Spain's doing something pretty weird right now, but <clears throat> Nicaragua could do very normal things and still have it make a lot of sense. Now, all of that is to say that there's nothing that we do in promoting a country or anything else that forces their hand. If this was a store, and let's say uh, we were just you know, fans of the local Best Buy, and we're like, hey, they've got some great deals on laptops, you should come down, I love buying my laptops here, and I just kept advertising, and they had floods and floods of people coming in to get their laptops. Well, at some point, they can close their doors. Or if they don't want to close their doors, but they do want to curtail the number of people getting laptops, they can raise the price on the laptops until it slows the traffic down to a point that makes sense for them. They are not stuck selling things at a pace that I promote, right? It just doesn't work that way. And so uh, there's, there's this uh, complete control in the hands of the country. Now, are they likely to let it go a little bit farther than ideal? Of course they are. It's just the nature of things. But we have to get there first. It doesn't make any sense to avoid doing good things because we're afraid that doing bad things will be the result. Now, if we know bad things are going to be the result, but that is not what we know at all. What we know is currently Nicaragua needs more tourists. It would help with job creation, which is a big deal, and it would help with quite a bit less, but it potentially can do some help with uh, uh, salary rates. And more importantly, it can help offset the collapse of the uh, the real estate industry. Like There's just so many houses for sale and so few buyers. There's lots of empty places, which it means that prices are depressed and people are unable to sell them when they need to. These are all things that we can potentially at least help, if not fix, by increasing tourism and increasing the number of expats who stay here. Each one has slightly different effects, but they, they basically do the same thing when they come into a country. So we don't want to not create jobs because we're afraid of maybe raising the cost of living. That's a really bad approach, right? Costa Rica certainly is not responding to having most of their population employed by saying, oh, it's so awful. I mean, we wish that everybody was employed, but we want to keep everything super, super cheap. No, they say we'd much rather have everyone employed, and then, yes, there's a risk that some things are going to get a little bit more expensive. But like we say, people who know what they're doing in Costa Rica, while it's not going to be as cheap as Nicaragua, it's not as expensive as what tourists are typically paying. So people are mostly able to live there. Is it getting too expensive for some people? Yes. Are there negatives to pretty much any system? Yes. But are the negatives of having too much tourism, too much economy, really that bad in Costa Rica compared to having people be unemployed in Nicaragua? No. 
that is definitely, if they had to choose between the two, not only would Costa Rica continue to choose what they chose, I guarantee that Nicaragua would choose to go down the same path if that was the alternative, but it doesn't have to be. They can do what they need to create the jobs and cut it off there. That is absolutely an option for Nicaragua. Costa Rica has gone all in on tourism as their main industry. That is just who they've embraced being as a country. Someone was likely to do that. They did. No one else needs to do that. It doesn't matter if Nicaragua is the next up and coming Costa Rica like location, which it's not. But if it became that, it does not imply that it will go so far as to become Costa Rica. There's no there's no precedence for that. It doesn't work that way. Costa Rica would continue uh, down its path. We assume probably not just ahead of Nicaragua, but at a pace that Nicaragua would never catch, right? That that anything that made Nicaragua start to get close to it would make Costa Rica stay in front of it we expect, right? Are there, are there possibilities? Are there ways that this could happen? Yes, but not because of my channel and not because of something that's irreversible. It would happen because the people of Nicaragua decided that this is the path they wanted to go down and pushed the government to continue to do so over a period of decades, many decades, right? This is not something that could possibly happen in two or five years or even 10 years. We're talking 50 to 100 years for this kind of thing to happen. Costa Rica has been creating the situation that they're in, and that makes it sound negative. We don't know that it is. A lot of Nicaraguans, we feel that it's negative. If we look at Costa Rica, we're like, we don't want that to happen here. But that doesn't mean that it will. But they've been working on it for a long time to get to where they are. And partially, they like where they are because it's what their plan has been. They've always had that plan. And so it really is a different animal. And the idea that, that Nicaragua is just going to end up there doesn't make sense. We talked about this in another video a while ago. There's other countries in the region that have a lot more tourism than Nicaragua. Panama, Guatemala, El Salvador. All of them have a lot more of this effect already happening. So for it to happen to Nicaragua would require us to either pass all of those countries, plausible for sure, but hard, uh, but not just catch up to them, but then stay in front of them and, and grow at a, at a completely different pace to be able to even be in the running for this. Otherwise, it's gonna to happen to everyone else first. By the time it's happening to Nicaragua, we're basically looking at the entire world being overrun with tourists. Could that happen at some point? It's a scary future possibility that people kind of hypothesize, but realistically, we have no reason to anticipate Malthusianism, Malthusia's tourism as being uh, kind of the end of humanity, it is, it is just an unlikely scenario. And so I don't think worrying about Nicaragua being over-touristed is something that realistically we have to worry about. I know some people just don't want things to change, and that's just not how the world works. Like, you, yeah, I understand a lot of people just dislike change, but we need to try to improve things, right? There are people who need jobs, there's people who need better pay, there's people who need food, there's people who need shelter or better shelter or better opportunities for their kid. And we can't consider ever intentionally holding that back because we're worried that someday we may make an unrelated or loosely related decision to not keep, uh, to not apply the brakes when it gets to a healthy point and then go too far. It's just not, it's kind of like saying, I, I need to go to the hospital, but I'm worried about not hitting the brakes when I get there and just slamming into the wall of the hospital. So instead, I'm not going to go to the hospital. And that doesn't make sense. We know that driving to the hospital, yes, it does give you the opportunity to be in the parking lot of the hospital where you could forget to hit the brakes and slam into the wall. If you didn't drive to the hospital in the first place, you wouldn't be in that position. So there is a connection, but it's super loose. But the decision to go to the hospital does not imply the decision to not drive properly once you're at the hospital. No amount of, I needed to get to the hospital is going to make you also think you should just slam into the wall at full speed. So we shouldn't apply this kind of logic that if we try to improve things today that we will by definition, simply be forced to go too far and have it be out of our control. There's no precedent for that, no reason to think that would happen. And I know people are looking at Costa Rica, they're also looking at Spain and France, Italy, Greece, and places that have let this happen. But I think that this is misleading because just like in Nicaragua, there are enclaves or there are tourist destinations. The example, of course, here is San Juan del Sur. This is a place that is, by all intents and, and design, has been set aside for over-tourism. It is full of expats who are running businesses that are catering to American and Canadian tourists and backpackers, and they have activities for them, and everything in this little town is designed around tourism and expats. And that's absolutely fine. And that makes for people 
when you come to Nicaragua, there's a very high chance that you're going to go to San Juan del Sur and you will get this feeling of, boy, there's a lot of tourists here. It wouldn't take much for this to be too many. Not that you're experiencing too many now, but it's easy to see how it could happen. And then you hypothesize that, ooh, if we keep promoting how wonderful it is, that more people all of a sudden are going to find out and come flooding down. And I know that feels like a risk. What if every American suddenly realized how good Nicaragua is? Well, certainly Nicaragua would be overwhelmed overnight if somehow you could do that, but you can't. You're never going to get even 0.1% of Americans to even realistically consider Nicaragua, let alone consider it to a point where they would get on a plane and just come down. That those numbers would be overwhelming. Absolutely. But that's not going to happen at all. It is so far out of the realm of possibility. There's no reason to entertain that thought. But if we do over time get so many people to come down, yes, they're going to have to make some changes in the future. But it's not going to happen overnight. It's not just going to, we don't just say, hey, it's a beautiful country and people go, and suddenly everyone says, oh, that's for me and just move down. So by having these enclaves, you get this impression that it's far more touristy than it is. And we have so much protection against it in the rest of the country. Now, in Costa Rica, you have very few enclaves or very few places that are completely isolated enclaves in the way that San Juan del Sur is here in Nicaragua. What instead you have is a very large region or group of regions within the country that have uh, a large number of expats and tourists all over the place. This is very, very general throughout Costa Rica. So they have this effect that it is sprawled all throughout the country and affects nearly every bit of life. And so that is one of the reasons that we see Costa Rica so differently. When you come to Nicaragua, because we have these enclaves that have the majority of our tourists and expats in them, San Juan del Sur being the most dense, Granada being another example where there's a huge number of tourists and expats living in or staying in Granada. And while it is anything but an enclave, it is a city catering to tourism. And so those locations, along with maybe Ometepe and a little tiny bit in Managua, you basically have almost all of the tourists and expats isolated in places where you can easily avoid them and they can easily avoid everyone else. And not everyone wants to avoid them and they don't necessarily all want to avoid everyone else, but there's an awful lot of people who don't want to see tourists all the time. And there's an awful lot of tourists who just want to see attractions and aren't looking to interact with locals. And so there's a natural segregation for the majority of both sides. And that leaves most of Nicaragua completely free of expats and tourists, or one or two scattered throughout huge areas. And so if you actually spend time traveling around Nicaragua and see it as a much more cohesive whole and see large bits of the country, you very quickly come to the realization that these are not realistic fears. San Juan del Sur looks like if you just spend time there, you're like, there's so much of this tourism industry. It really is changing the local culture. It's changing how people behave. It's changing the cost of living. Absolutely it is in an absolutely tiny little village that is super remote. If we go and we look at what it's like in other places, we go look even at Las Venitas and Ponaloya, major, major beaches that should be, by all logical accounts, maybe not as popular as San Juan del Sur, but really close to them because of their accessibility to a city, because of the amenities they offer, because of the type of water they have, whatever. These are places that should be really popular. But when you actually go to them, are there expats? Absolutely there are. But are there large numbers of them that are completely changing the local culture? No. It's getting closer, but it has not happened yet. There just aren't that many. So there's only this one beach location, maybe two with, with Papoyo, in all of Nicaragua that realistically have a beach that has locals that would go to it and is heavily influenced by foreigners. That's how few foreigners we have. If you go into the normal cities, you're in Hinotepe, Hinotega, Matagalpa, Esteli, Chinandega, Leon, uh, Masaya, most of Managua, Tipitapa, Ciudad Sandino, uh, Buaco, Huigalpa, Bilwi, Bluefields. You have so few tourists that you'll be shocked by how little there is. It'll be like visiting Utica, New York or Bakersfield, California. Would you be absolutely astonished to see someone who wasn't from that town walking around? No, but you would wonder, why are you here? What brought you here? You're the anomaly. And unless they say, oh no, I've got family in the area, I'm just here for a family reunion or whatever, then, they, then they're going to be like, why? Why did you pick, you know, Youngstown, Ohio as a place to go be a tourist? And, and they would be justified because people don't do that. It doesn't have attractions. It does, there's just nobody does that. And, and so that's really how most of Nicaragua functions today. That's the feel you're going to have as you go around the country. So you can 
look at this 99% or maybe 99.9% of the land area of Nicaragua does not have these problems with tourists, does not have the possibility of being overrun anytime in the near future. We're talking about needing millions of tourists compared to the thousands that are here now to flood into the country to have anything near that kind of effect. So our takeaway is one, don't worry about what is most likely other countries and regions pushing a narrative of trying to discourage travel and tourism to Nicaragua in the under the guise of protecting Nicaragua so that they can encourage more tourism to their regions. This is not likely Costa Rica, but a lot of places you can imagine would like to get tourists because nearly everybody Worldwide, it has fewer tourists than they wish they had. It is very rare for a country to have as many as would be ideal. So nearly everyone wants to discourage travel to other places so that they can benefit their own economies. So don't worry about that narrative. You can ignore that. That's, that's just not something you really have to worry about. And you don't have to worry about Nicaragua suddenly exploding and, and tipping over the point that they have too many tourists and, and expats. Realistically, you're looking at decades of solid growth before that could possibly become of a major concern. And finally, there are many ways both that we as expats and as potential expats would see the changes, whether it's rising cost, lack of availability of housing, more tourists around that would automatically start us to apply our own brakes naturally, as well as the government and the people have their own processes by which they can apply the brakes soft or hard or even completely block additional tourism and expatting as is needed. We're not going to have a runaway train. That's not something that actually happens. Places that have seemed like that, such as Barcelona, or Venice. These are isolated locations within a general economy where up until very recently places like Italy and Spain have been completely into encouraging as much tourism as possible. Now they've realized that there are isolated locations that have been overrun and they may have created a negative situation in isolated pockets. But if you go to the majority of Spain, including places like Madrid and, and Sevilla and Granada and Cordoba and, and Cadiz and places that would seem like, oh, they could, they could be easily overrun with tourists. Are you going to see some tourists? Absolutely. Are they overrun? No. They still represent really good cultural places where you can go and live as an expat and not feel like you're part of an expat community. You will feel like you're part of Spain. These are big operating cities that are completely functional on their own, maintaining their own culture. Same thing in Italy, same thing in France. It is only because at a grand scale that my, at Spain, for example, as a very large country, has encouraged so much uh, tourism and that it turns out that so much of it is isolated to Barcelona in this example or to, uh, to, to Marbella in the south. Now, Marbella, they've really kind of artificially created a, an enclave, so that doesn't really negatively impact anyone. But for someplace like Barcelona, where people actually live, it has negative, negatively impacted people, and they are adjusting for that now. But that's a local adjustment. Spain, as a country, really doesn't want to stop tourism. It's still important for people all throughout Spain to have that economy. That brings us to one final point that I want to talk about, and that is the enclave living situation. A lot of people think of enclaves as being very negative, mostly because they are a set apart kind of thing. And that seems like a negative, like someone comes to the country, but they don't want to participate. Well, that has a negative feel to it for sure. Why are they here if they don't want to be a part of us? But there are lots of reasons, for example, for an American to maybe not dislike Nicaragua, but have zero interest in it, right? They are not Spanish speakers. They are not uh, Latin or Hispanic in any way. They struggle to learn a language. They like where they come from, but the United States may be too costly. Maybe it doesn't have good enough health care. Maybe it doesn't have the in-home health care needs that they that they uh, have or can't meet those needs. Maybe it's simply unaffordable and they can't they can't live in the United States and they need a place to go. Enclaves provide perfect opportunities for people who want the benefits that have to come with being in a new country, right? They want the benefit of their laws, their safety, their weather, their climate, those kinds of things their location, their time zone, but they don't necessarily want to participate in the culture. Not that they're against it, not that they're negative, simply it's not something that they're looking to expand. If Especially Americans, but people from all over the world, right? The average person doesn't want to move to a new location and experience a new culture deeply. They may want to go see it, but they don't want to change what their lifestyle is like. That's not the norm. Those people who watch my channel, we tend to be those people. So we tend to see the world as that being a little bit more normal when 
in reality, we're the abnormal ones. So when you have the bulk of Americans who are looking to move abroad, they're looking for places that meet specific needs, but they were hoping, or many times are hoping, that they'll be able to maintain the TV shows, the sporting events, the cultural interactions, the types of neighbors and friends that they've had from other places. They know they're going to a new location, but they're hoping to maintain as much as they can of ties back to their home country, just with the weather or cost of living or safety, whatever that, they, that they're looking, whatever's gonna fulfill their, their needs. And that is not actually a negative. I know why we all feel that it is. Emotionally, we always are going to feel that way, but it is not. And to a place like Nicaragua, it is not a negative really at all because those people really don't have a negative impact on the country. They don't have a positive social impact, but they do have a positive financial impact while generally being walled away in their little enclave, doesn't, not necessarily locked away, but in some cases it really is. And they're able to be in that place and experience Nicaraguan weather, laws, safety, all those positive things in a way that doesn't have any negative connotations to Nicaragua. No one is, is experiencing their culture. No one's eroding Nicaraguan culture because it's an enclave. And so the enclave is able to go on and generate revenue. It still has to buy produce. It has to buy services. It has to hire staff. It has to get food delivered. It has to all these things, get cars serviced, construction work done, um, you know, plumbing done is all being done by local labor. And so they're providing a positive economic impact, potentially a really significant one, while having essentially no cultural impact, which is really important. And in fact, one could argue, and I don't know if this is true, but you can easily hypothesize that those people who are the enclave livers, maybe, yes, maybe not San Juan del Sur, where they're a little bit more interacting with society in most cases, but the people who are uh, uh, in the really, really heavily walled enclaves where they're really not interacting with culture at all. They're just ordering in services. They're being whisked away to the airport and they're, they're not interacting with Nicaragua in any way because they have no negative impacts, no real negative impacts on Nicaragua. They're just providing revenue into the system. They don't need any assistance. They're not reliant. They don't even have access to a lot of things because they're so isolated. They may actually be doing less erosion of culture than those of us who try to integrate. And I'm not saying we shouldn't try to do that, but for those of us, like me, who try to be a part of Nicaraguan society, I try to do things with Nicaraguan friends and go out and I'm learning Spanish and I try to do cultural things that Nicaraguans do. I try to live like a Nicaraguan for the most part, not entirely, but, but by and large. I actually represent a watering down of the Nicaraguan culture. Wherever I go, I'm always the person who the music's a little bit too loud. It's always harder for me to hear. I'm not pushing the culture in the same way that a Nicaraguan will. At best, I'm being dragged along, not unwillingly, and I'm trying to integrate, but I will always be an outside factor who, to some degree, doesn't maintain exactly the same cultural interaction. I don't use the local pulperia as much as a Nicaraguan would likely use them. I don't use the local bar as much as a Nicaraguan would likely use them. And I don't use them in exactly the same way. I'm not buying the same products. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, ordering the same food. And every little change like that risks a little bit watering down of the culture. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try. It doesn't mean that it's a terrible thing. It doesn't mean that we're not having an overall positive impact, but there is an argument that we are more disruptive to the culture than the enclave livers, because the enclave livers, you can see their enclave, but they're over there. And for those of us who are here, we're mixing in and we're introducing outside elements and we're slowly adapting, but that acts a little bit as a community dampening force, hopefully an incredibly minor one, hopefully one that overall creates a positive effect. Hopefully we bring good things to the table so when we are enacting changes by accident that they are positive and not negative or at least neutral, uh, but that is a real thing. So don't think of the enclaves in the negative way necessarily. Of course, there could be negatives associated with the enclaves, but they are separate from the fact that they're enclaves. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Don't worry about coming down to Nicaragua. There's plenty of space, plenty of opportunity, whether you're looking and moving to someplace with lots of other tourists and expats like San Juan del Sur, or you want to get away and you really do want to integrate with society. Don't let the possibility that you may have a negative impact uh, dissuade you because the fact that you're worried about it basically guarantees that any negative you're going to bring is going to be extremely negative and the chances that you won't bring a lot of positives is very low. Nicaragua knows that having more tourists and expats is currently good for it. 
it wouldn't be working so hard to make it so easy and safe and inviting for you to come down if they didn't think that it was the best thing for them as well. Of course, they hope it's a good thing for you, but primarily they have to look out for their own citizens, and that's exactly what they're doing. So when you feel that you're being welcomed to Nicaragua, take that to heart. You really are being welcomed because they really do believe that you have a good chance of being a significant positive impact on the country as a whole and making a positive difference. So give them that chance uh, to, to be proven right and uh, come down and experience it for yourself. We do have a new membership system, feel no pressure, but we do have a way that you can join if you want to help support the channel in an ongoing subscription kind of way. That button is down there and uh, doesn't really offer a lot of services, but it really does make a big difference uh, to supporting the channel and the stuff that we do. But make sure you hit that like, share with a friend, tell someone about the show, and I'll see all of you tomorrow.